Hello there, listeners. Pat Healy here from Berkeley Online. Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast. Take note of Evan Dando from the Lemonheads. Our featured guest this month has been releasing music for more than 30 years, reaching a commercial high point in the early and mid-90s with the albums It's a Shame About Ray and Come On Feel the Lemonheads. Now, most of the attention that the band received at that time came from a cover of Simon and Garfunkel's Mrs. Robinson, which Evan Dando was not too happy about for a while, saying that the record label basically duped him into recording it just so that they could tack it onto his album without his permission. And he finally came around to liking the track when Martin Scorsese featured it in a film in 2013. That would probably have that effect on anybody. One of Dando's greatest talents has always been reworking unlikely cover songs and really making them his own. And the latest Lemonheads album, Varsions 2, is full of them, from obscure bands to contemporary country superstars. Evan Dando also has a knack for writing his own songs, and he says he is hoping to work on a new original album in the fall. For now, though, he has tour dates through May and June. Check thelemonheads.net for more details. He formed the band in Boston with high school classmates Ben Diley and Jesse Peretz. And even though there's been more than 20 members who've come and gone since then, he says he could probably name them all. Evan Dando reached out to us by phone from his place in Martha's Vineyard. And like many of our guests, he says his exposure to music began through what his parents listened to. Let's let him tell you about it. My parents' music, Al Green, and they had mostly, mostly soul music I used to do as a kid. You know, and Martin the Vandellas, Heat Wave, and stuff. Yeah, and then uh, the first thing I bought would have been Modern Lovers, uh, the Kim Fowley demos, the first Kim Fowley demos of the Modern Lovers. I bought, like, a bootleg on Mohawk Records um, when I was 14. Yeah, what, what was your outlet to discover that? I mean, that wasn't exactly all over the airwaves. I just, say like, no, it just... um. Well, my dad, um, he would go see um, the, the Modern Lovers in, in, in Government Center. Like, and they used to play there. He'd go see them at lunch down, down right in the Government Center. And so he was always talking about them. And then um, I was already at Commonwealth uh, High School. And um, we, we, I had some friends there who introduced me to Velvet Underground and, and the Stooges and, and the, 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 the um, Modern Lovers at that point. So, you know, about 14, I started getting into those kind of stuff, those kind of things, like the Stooges and um, the Velvets and the, and the Modern Lovers. Yeah. And, and were you playing at that time? I mean, what was the first instrument you picked up? Yeah. I mean, I always played. I started playing at about nine or, nine or ten. But I was still playing, you know, but... Um, I didn't really, I sort of stopped playing for a little while when after a little bit, after a little, turn about 16, I stopped listening to rock. I just listened to classical and jazz music for like a whole year. You know, the idealism of when you're like 16 or so, you, you know, you, I just listened to like classical and then jazz, you know, modern jazz music and, and classical for a while and put away all my rock records. And that was until about 80, 84 when I went to see Flipper. I went to see Flipper at All Ages Show. And well, our friend Patrick Amory had started so he went punk, you know, and so we all kind of followed him. He sort of went punk too, and and then um he started he did a record the uh, record the record hospital on 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 Harvard Radio, and they did a punk rock orgy, and we we all got into like punk rock in eighty four eighty five, um so then that that set up started being in a band, you know, playing music again because I could play that kind of music, you know. Now when um, you had your classical. Um... I don't know, what do you want to call it? A detour, a phase? Uh, phase were, yeah. were you like even attempting to play any of that stuff or was you just appreciating Well, I was it? in the jazz band. Yeah, I was in the jazz band until they said, okay, they didn't realize I couldn't read music. <laughs> they let me take solos for a long time. And then I, one day I got they, they, I got busted. They were like, play a major scale. I didn't know what they were talking about. So I got kicked out of the jazz band. But that was fun for a little while. Um, and so after that, I had to sort of we start, after that I sort of started my own band because uh, I couldn't play in the jazz band anymore. But um, uh, yeah. And, and we're at, back at home. You, your father introduced you to a bunch of cool stuff. Did he play at all, or did anybody else in your family play? Yeah, he played. He would play bass and he played acoustic guitar and he would play bass occasionally. And he was I guess Neil Young was another big thing for for them. Everybody knows his nowhere was was always blasting when I was, since I was a little kid in the back room when I lived up in Essex. Uh -huh. and, and did you take le lessons or yeah. did you just learn it on your own? 
Um, not really. Not, I, my, no, I mean, I, I just, yeah, self-taught. I did, I did one lesson where we did a group lesson and taught me some scales, but yeah. I didn't really need, after that it was fine, and I just sort of look where the dots are, you know, and um, get books with songs and learn the songs. You know, it, took, it came pretty naturally to me. It was really fun. How long did it take till you got to a place with your instrument that you were comfortable and, you know, able to start figuring out songs on your own? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. When I was like ten, I, I was by the beginning. I mean, it takes about a year to really learn, so you can change your hands, the chords quickly enough to but just sing a song along with it. But I guess when I was about ten, ten or ten and eleven, I started like playing a lot, and I had an electric guitar by then, and, and uh, it was just real easy and fun. I'd just sit with my cat and play guitar all day. I think the first time I saw Lemonheads play was like. 1990, maybe 91. Yeah, well, we started in 86. Right, but when did you get the uh, the that classic SG that you usually? Oh use? yeah, that one. I got really early, like 84 or so. Uh huh. Yeah, I got that in 84. And and, do you, and you still you still have it? Yeah, well, no, I've got that one. I fell off stage once. And it got totally smashed into a million pieces. But um, no, that one's gone. But. I have one like it. Is is that your go to for like the sound? Yeah, for some reason I really like SGs, although they don't stay in tune very well. But you can say you can I have like a I moved I like the P ninety pickup now. I like the I like the older ones, like maybe six the mid sixties ones, like sixty four with like one P ninety in it, um, or two. I really like those single coil pickups now. But I used to use humbuckers, but now I like I like single coil pickups better. Now. The P90s. I have like a white one. I really like that. So you found the guitar that would kind of define your sound at a young age. Yeah, right away. Yeah, a lot of people just sort of figure they just use the one guitar always. You know, they like that one. But then when they start making money or whatever, they buy a bunch of different ones. But it's, it's those two records, like it's the same about Ray and Come On Two Lemon. It's just that one, one same electric guitar and uh, two acoustics. Like we, I'd put these two acoustics on every song. So you guys just discovered punk rock with the flipper show and yeah and was was the first lineup was you ben and jesse yeah right? yeah that's right yep yep we just practiced underneath the stairs like you know and i'm uh, getting shit from our the janitor once in a while but um we just uh yeah we practiced at, at, at our high school it was really fun every once in a while our english teacher would come down and say it sounds like someone falling down a really long staircase <laughs> yeah that's what he used to say <laughs> like doo, 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 yeah. Because we just put, switched off on drums, we couldn't really, we didn't really know how to play drums much, but we could do it kind of. And it was um, playing drums is really fun, you know, even if you don't know how quite for a while. But now I've got it down pretty good. I've been playing a lot of drums. I have, I have a drum set set up in my uh, apartment here. Yeah. Did you take lessons there? Oh no, I never learned how to play drums either. But I just taught myself how to do it. So the groups together, and then you're evolving. And you know, you make the first EP, and mm -hmm. does does it occur to you like, oh, this this is it? I f I love this. I want to do this forever. Well, I really like I liked it. You know, when we started getting, we got offered a tour in Europe in '89, so we did that. And I realized, you know, the the two other people in my punk band were going to Harvard, so it didn't seem like I had a really good, really long future in it. Yeah. So I quit the band in '88. I joined the Blake Babies for like eight months, but then we got offered a tour in Europe, so. I rejoined the Lemonheads and to go to do this tour in Europe because you know that kind of music was was really popular in Germany at the time. You know, like Mud Honey and and, and us and stuff. Just they really liked they really liked it in '89. And we were playing like uh, to the two thousand people by 1990. You know, like we were playing yeah, you know, about two thousand people over there a show. Like in, we got really popular in Germany early on, and then England after that. What was the moment when you knew that this was something you could do for a career? Probably just on like the fourth or fifth time we went over to Europe and played, you know, it was just so much fun and was able to travel and, and see these places like Vienna and like, you know, like over and over again and going back to like places in Germany and stuff. And that just appealed to me, to my nature, you know, I, I was like traveling. So, and, and seeing experiences. And so I realized I really wanted to do it for a long time. So yeah, I just like decided to do it because we, we had this, these offers and stuff. So I went back to the Lemonheads and sort of just made it into whatever I wanted it to be really at that point. What was the feeling on Jesse and Ben's part where they just like, go for it, we're, we're not doing anything? Or Well, Jesse stayed with it for a while, right? Yeah, Jesse stayed with it, but Ben Ben left. Um, he was doing other stuff, so he, he left. He, yeah, he left a while ago, like in 89. But um, yeah, Jesse stayed with it till like 92 or so, 93. 
he would take the pictures and stuff for the for the right and make the video. So he's still part of it, you know. Uh-huh. It was all very amicable and stuff. I joined the Blake Babies for eight months, but then had to quit again. And meanwhile, uh, Juliana, uh, she had come here to Berkeley, right? And did did Frida did Frida and John go here too, or mostly John and Juliana who were in there? I you know I, I at the time, of course, I was a little bit um, full, you know, young and thinking really cool and stuff. You know, and they were teaching to my uh, for a little while, there was this teacher that taught taught my songs at Berkeley. So I, I was a bit, you know, I get a little full of myself at that point. And I was, you know, thinking, oh, I don't know, I don't need, I don't need this, this, um, all this formal, uh, you know, I might have, might have begrudged it a little bit. But you know, I, I never, I never made fun of John and Julia. I thought it was really cool that they were learning about music. It just wasn't ever for me. You know, I didn't really know how to do that. Uh, to, but I, I was, ha- I was satisfied with just kind of making it up and keeping the mystery about it, even though it's sort of a funny position i think to, to maintain but I, at the time i was happy with it so wait there there was a teacher here teaching your songs there was yeah there was back in 92 93 there was a guy there that would ask me about the song and he said he was teaching him there at, at berkeley oh that's cool I don't know what the guy's, yeah i don't know what his name was but things that come and go but um uh yeah i mean i got nothing against formal music study yeah, I just never really did it myself. Right. I mean, I did for a little while. Like in tenth grade, I started to go to music theory class, learned about some stuff, and then I forgot it again. Yeah. yeah. So what? Yeah. <laughs> when? At what point did did you start to take songwriting seriously? Like, um, you know, hmm. with the first album, there's there's definitely some songs that indicate that you're taking it seriously, yeah. but it's also a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm, I mean, I think it always has should always be fun, you know, even if you're taking it seriously, but um. Yeah, I mean, I just was trying and trying, and I, I got gradually got better at it, um, and uh, sort of felt like I was rising to the occasion because I mean, it felt like we were in a position to, you know, to be kind of popular, and we were coming up in a time where we might get some attention, and so we just sort of like trying to rise to the occasion. I think back then, and just sort of write some good songs and try to approach it a little bit differently, and try to write some, like my drug, but it's got no rhymes and it's got no real chorus, but it's still a good song. You know, I just try to do things, do things slightly differently, or you know, but but never try to break any real new ground. But just trying to write good songs. Yeah, what, you mentioned my drug buddy just there, right? Yeah. So was, was that a? That's a good song. Dude. It really is a good I like song. It. Just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's got no rhymes really, but it, no chorus really, except to the end. But it sort of breaks some of the things down. It doesn't have to uh, follow all the convention as far as normal songwriting but i like that song it's sort of more in the in the tradition of like a song like frank mills where there's no rhymes and it just like goes along its way and tells a little story right what, what did that feel like a, yeah. a breakthrough breakthrough moment for you in your songwriting yeah yeah i guess that yeah that whole album a lot of those songs were like a were like breakthrough songs and whereas you know i was wanting to um i mean like go against the the thing which was like popular now which is like really heavy stuff where we've been heavier before and louder and more punk rock and they're like well we're going to do something different just to like despite everyone I'm just going to do something like quieter you know almost like a perverse perversity you know just to, to, to confound people's expectations i think it's it's almost like yeah. uh being more punk rock than punk rock yeah yeah <laughs> something like that and uh, also just the way i was headed i just wanted to do more i was listening to a lot of country music and sort of country tinge sort of stuff mm-hmm birds birdsy sort of stuff and, and the, al- yeah. the album before has has a few numbers on it that really feel like uh you know uh, people point to stove a lot and yeah right yep yep i like that one a lot uh, that one that one was an early one where it's like a just had a riff and wanted to write a story story about what's going to happen yeah that was like that yeah, very much early one of my style of songwriting really. well you have this new album out that's a uh, sequel of sorts uh, covers album and you've even before that always been known for your ability to transform a song oh, yeah what was your original approach to other people's material well we, what we did was we um we would do songs all originally done by women so we did um luca a um, different drum strange by patsy klein um and uh well those were all those were all done originally by women that's what we used mainly do um just so easy to make them different and we also did step by step by new kids on the block uh, i don't know i guess we do more um but originally we just do two songs originally by women so you just make them different 
that would be seen in a different drum and Luca. Right, right. That's that's kind interesting. I didn't know it was a conscious decision to. Uh, it, why was that? Sort of, yeah. I don't know. I just sort of fun fun to do it that way. You know, it's like um, easy to make them different. You know? Right. And maybe just you know mess with people's minds a little bit. I don't know. Just like. And so through through this time. Uh, we we haven't really touched upon like the Boston scene and what was happening and and what mm-hmm. what was happening also in in the broader sense and did did yeah. you feel a part of anything uh, whether mm-hmm. whether it be like a national movement or a local movement or it always well definitely you know we, yeah definitely it just I was just gonna say it always ex- seemed to almost exist outside of it yeah but you know we we, we did we. And toured the West Coast with Mount Honey, you know, and we, we shared a practice space with the Pixies and stuff. So we just, we were, you know, definitely part of like this thing where we, we knew we were part of a certain time of, of music and guitar bands. And and it was fun to be to be a part of it, really. I mean, just to be around it and see it happening, you know, Dinosaur Jr. or whatever, all that stuff. Um, that even during these and stuff. You know, we run into everyone on the road, and, and we're just talking to people, and it was really, really fun time. Yeah, back then, it, it's funny to look at like the history of music over the past like forty or so years, and and yeah. did, did you know, you know, did you grasp that you know guitar music wouldn't be popular forever or anything like that? Did did you recognize where well, you were? Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, you, yeah, you know, everything trends come and go, so you, you always know it's going to keep oscillating like uh, going up and down or whatever. so um but you know we never really worry about it too much because like you just keep doing what you want what you like doing and sooner or later it'll, it'll come back to the fashion or something. right yeah have you found yeah. have you found that to be true with like do you see what are the ages of the face faces you see on tour people yeah it seems like people really um are interested in, in music from the 90s again you know like anything like before the internet or something it seems like it has some sort of mystery to it still or something like wow you know like, i don't know it seems like it's a real thing or something i don't know you know it, as much as the internet hasn't hurt music you know I, I'm, I'm more of the of the opinion that it hasn't done anything that bad to music in fact it hasn't hurt it really at all because there's still new bands coming up and you know more than ever so it's, I, mean, I don't really see anything wrong with it mm-hmm. But people do like seem to be interested in the '90s stuff still somehow because it was a time of, of a lot of good music. Mm-hmm. I loved yeah. seeing that. I, I don't know where I saw it, but uh, some clip of you and Courtney Barnett singing together. And, and oh yeah, 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 it's cool. Yeah, it, it's cool. It, it extends to weird echoes like that to be kids now, like uh, like Courtney. Yeah, that was really cool. Uh, and um, that was a nice thing to to find out about and to do. To yeah, it was good. Yeah, she was really good. We um, we did a tour with her. My band with my friend Willie Mason and, and Mark Shana, we we have a band called um, the, the Sandwich Police, and we did a tour with Courtney Barnett um, a couple of years ago. That was fun too. Oh, cool! Well, yeah, yeah, I think th- yeah. I think I saw the Sandwich Police one time. And what what kind of stuff oh, yeah. is there? An album, or where are you guys drawing? There's in? like a, no, there's just a single. We did three songs, like on a on a um. It was put out by I can't even remember the label. Um, <laughs> I can't remember now, but um, it's just like it looks like the Dream Syndicate record, Days of Wine and Roses. It's like a direct copy of that record cover. Yeah. It's like with the blood with the blue square and on white, and uh, um, it's sort of like a modern art sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, we put out just a single on um some record label. I can't remember now what it's called, but uh, they put it out. And, but yeah, not much. We haven't done any promotion ever for that band, but I really like that band. Right. It's a, it's a great name, too. Forward. It's a great yeah. name, especially yeah. like Cape and Islands, because, you know, Sandwich, the town. Exactly, Sandwich, yeah. yeah. So when, when we were talking a little bit before about, you know, feeling like part of a scene and then, you know, the Lemonheads really blew up and your yeah. your face was on every magazine. And, and yeah. when, when you have such perspective now... What are your thoughts when you look back on that era? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess it, it really was a. Um, I couldn't have been lucky. You know, I was lucky um, that way, and um, to be to do okay in what I was trying to do. And um, you know, that thing with the Mrs. Robinson cover was was unfortunate. But now that now that the Wolf of Wall Street came out, I think it's okay. it'll almost make puts it into the positive uh, uh, category co- column because of um. You want everyone wants a song in a Scorsese movie, so, <laughs> so we got our our that thing. So that was cool. But I mean, that, you know, we made mistakes. We were put, put we had pressure put on us. We were seen as like a short term thing, and like you know, like you know, they wanted to milk us for all we were worth. Basically, the music industry is a rough place, and uh, 
But I mean, you know, it, it was everything I could have uh, hoped for, basically, you know, when you're trying to do something like this, to have opportunities, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, basically, so I'm happy. When, when they had you do that song, it, it, were they like, were there, were there suits in the studio just standing with their arms folded? Or was it, did you at least have fun with it? It was kind of like that. It was, they didn't bother actually coming to the studio, but they were there in theory, you know, in, 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 uh, yeah, in theory and, and the idea of people like, wanting us to do this song. They were like, yeah, come on, come on, just do it, would you? And, um, you know, we got like a cash, we got some money. It was for something, you know, but I guess it was like a bait and switch sort of thing because it was really for, they put it on a record pretty quickly mm-hmm. and they put it out as a single. We, were, had no, we had no choice in that, really. But, you know, we weren't going to complain. We were just they're on tour and it helped stuff. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, but, I, you know, there was nothing to do. Again, we, we can really go against them at that point. So we'd already recorded it, so we were going to say. Um, so, yeah, we just went along with that stuff and got a lot of negative stuff from it, including from our friends and stuff. They're, you know, thought we were better than that, but whatever. Right. Yeah, luckily, Martin Scorsese put it in his movie, so I'm happy about it now. Right, right. Did, did you at least, yeah. least have fun recording it? Or, I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. I think Yeah, it was fun, yeah. Certainly. I mean, it's one of those things that, like, I don't know. I, w- I was a purist at the time, and I had the album yeah. before it was on on it, and I would, yeah. would poo poo fans who would be like, "Oh yeah, they they're the ones who did Mrs. Robinson." But, yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. <laughs> but but yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what it translates is that it sounds like it's a band having fun with an old song that you know wasn't. That's that the thing. Fun. It, it, yeah, I mean, it really not. You know, how serious you're gonna get about it? Really, you know, that's the kind of thing that reminds me of. Um, because we did have fun recording, we just recorded, we just did it once too. That was the first time we played it, and oh, we wow. realized we get it. We got just sort of different parts down, and we're like, okay, press record. That was it. We did it once. We did it only once, so that was cool. And right. then we started just do some. We did it in one night. Yeah, it was easy. You know, you've been doing covers a lot uh, with this recent album, and uh, yeah, we we haven't heard anything new in a while. No. But I'm guessing you're still writing. Yeah, I am. I've got a bunch of songs that just haven't but got it all together to make a really good record and i'm very picky these days about what i want to put out so i'm going to try to record it this fall but i mean i'm i really have to do it this fall because i've been i've been saying that for a while and so i gotta i gotta do it and it's been i'm getting close with a bunch i have a bunch of songs so i'm gonna do it oh cool and, are you playing the new songs yeah. live yeah some of them sometimes we do yeah we play a couple of them we play mostly old stuff though yeah. but we, we we'll play we'll break out a couple of new ones and, and who's who's in the band these days? Oh, myself, um, Chris Brokaw from Come and Coding. Um, yeah, and um, this kid Lee Falco from New York State, and uh, my friend Far- Farley Glavin from here on the Vineyard. He was in The Unbusted, and he was in like um, a bunch of bands. He was in Family of the Year for a while. Um, uh, yeah, Farley Glavin on bass. Yeah, cool. And, and Chris has been playing mm-hmm. with you for a while, right? Yeah, since two thousand. Wow, yeah. he he might be yeah. the longest running member besides you, huh? Oh yeah, right now, yeah. That's for, wild. For sure. He's been in it for a long time, yeah. That's amazing. yeah. I'm lucky to have someone like Chris playing with me. He's really good. Yeah, and it's funny because yeah. it's not the most like obvious match either. No, of course not. No, that's what's nice about it. Actually, yeah, it's totally not not, not an obvious match. Chris is sort of like the like um, you know, he's just like a. Yeah, it's not an obvious match anyway, but that, that's the nice thing about it. <laughs> yeah, I feel like if I if I were you and I was inviting him to join the, my band, I'd wonder if he would have the like. It seems like he's such a out there musician. Yeah, and, and yep. what was what was the the meeting point with you two? I, I think we just we, we had we had a um I, it was a, I had a manager we had a manager in common and um. And he, he hooked us up and we realized, well, we also, we'd been to each other's first shows. I was at the first come show. He was at the first time in that show. So we always known each other. And, um, so once we got to, you know, play, start playing, you know, we didn't have any preconceived notions about each other. So we realized we, we played really well together. So that was it basically, you know, that, mm-hmm. that's all it takes. You know, we did a tour right after nine 11. It was our first tour in, in Australia. And, uh, we had a good, really good time from then on. And, you know, we just been, we did some tours, just me and him. And, and we did some tours with the whole band. It's just been a good thing. He, you know, it, and to, to Chris's credit, he does all kinds of stuff, and including playing with me. You know, like that's how that's how adaptable he is because he does all kinds of stuff, like literally, like making records in Africa. He's done all kinds of stuff. He's a journeyman, or you know, he's um he's all over the all over the map in, in a good way. Right. 
Let's um let's yeah. let's talk a little bit. About, you mentioned Australia. Let's talk a little bit about that. And I always wondered was that um you know a, a place of awakening for you? I mean, because that that's where Definitely. you met met Tom, right? Tom Morgan. Yeah, Tom Morgan. Yeah, and um well, I met him through Nick Nick Dalton, who uh, was playing substitute for the Hummingbirds, who were supporting us in our first tour over there. And we went there because of Dan Peters. We were on tour. Or they were. On, um, it was this tour with Dust Domin and us and and Screaming Trees and and Dan Peters playing drums and, and Screaming Trees. And I met him with with Mud Honey. And um, I asked him, you know, we got a tour offer for Australia. And I said, should we go? And he's like, yeah, definitely go. So that's why I went. And then so that, that's about that. And then once we got there, we got to know Nick uh, Dalton, and he introduced me to Tom. And they were doing this thing called Sneeze. There's all these short songs. It's a really cool band called Sneeze. And uh, the Lemonheads recorded the basic tracks for a couple of songs for them. And I uh, just went from there. And Tom and I, I went back and opened for, opened for Fugazi in October of 91. And that's when I really hooked up and started writing with Tom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. W- what what was different in, in you know, before you had maybe, I, I don't know the extent of the collaboration that went on in the band before that, mm-hmm. but what uh, was different with the uh, chemistry between you two that you knew it would work? Uh, we just knew, I mean, we just hit it off right away, myself and Tom, we just would stay up and like, and, and write songs and, and um, it was just really easy for a long time. You know, we just, we wrote a bunch of songs together and, I, uh, and yeah, I didn't really collaborate much before that, but then I started doing that with him and it was fun. It was easy, and you know, down in Australia, everyone's on, the kids are on the dole, and so there's some extra free time there, you know, just like to, for rock and roll. Let's talk about from the big island of Australia to the much, much smaller island that you live on now. Mm. How long have you oh, lived yeah. there? Um, I, I moved here about maybe five, six years ago. Um, just uh, when I got out of the city, finally got out of New York, finally. I lived in New York for like 21 years. Like I did my last year in Brooklyn, but I was in Manhattan for the 20 for that. And then I realized I really liked I was coming up here, and I really liked it up here. So I just started staying up here, and I got rid of my apartment and just moved up here. And so it's where you know I, I was. I would come here as a kid. My, my dad moved here in like six, in like 78. And so I've been coming here a long time, and I just it's a really good little music scene too. And it's just a I just like I'm a little country person, so I really like being in the country. Mm-hmm. That's everything to me: moonlight and just like the stars and stuff. I really like it. Do you get the hell out of there in yeah. the summer, or do you stick around? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm here mainly, but yeah, I mean, it, it makes it really nice to be here. The fact that I go on tour and leave once in a while, you know, it's it's, it's hard to be anywhere all the time. I think, but um, especially here, because it's such a small town, like little thing being an island and everything's like a small town on steroids. Everyone starting to talk a lot. But it's good to get away. But um, is it also just wonderful place? I really just like it here. Great. But, um, yeah, it's a place for you know, finally found a fun place I, I don't like leaving. You know, I never like going, but I always like coming back. You know, so it's just and it's it's good to leave. Right, right. We talk about like uh, you, you mentioned it was felt good to be recognized by Courtney Barnett. It felt good to be recognized by Scorsese. Are there any other like lifelong interactions like that that have really meant a lot to you? Um, I think just like working with how Gelb is always really amazing. Um, his band called Giant Sand. They're really good. I did a band with him and uh, Juliana and uh, John Com- Comertino for a while in, in, in 91. And he's a, he's been a big factor in my life musically, like a good, a good um, uh, mentor or something. He's a little older than me. Um, yeah. Him and, and getting to know Gibby Haynes too, and working with him was really good too. Um, yeah, Gibby, Gibby's a really, real smart guy, and we always have a really good laugh together. He seems like an, another one of those kind of like uh, like Chris Brokaw, where it's almost surprising that he'd... Yeah, totally, yeah. His, you yep, know, yep, his totally. musical output is so off the wall. and uh, Yeah, totally, totally. Yep, you know, just like um, I've met people over here. I don't know, I just like... I definitely tend to transcend uh, whatever expectations I think about, about you know, and then people try to put people in categories, but you know, it doesn't really, really work, you know, in the end, people find each other anyway, you know. Right, right. You know. About, you know, the new Varsions album and, and covers, is, is there any song that you've always wanted to do, but like have never even attempted or? 
Um, well, I, want, I always want to do Sad Eyed Lady of the Lowlands, which is so, so long, and it's such a good song, but it's such a, like, a daunting uh, prospect. But I've never done that one yet. Yeah. I used to do it live. But you have to get like a lyric sheet out for that, though. I mean, it's really <laughs> fun, though. It's a good one. Yeah, I wanted to do that. I mean, there's lots of stuff I wanted to do. You know, I haven't got around to some of it. But... I, I liked the, uh, the Florida Georgia Line one because... Uh... Yeah, yeah. How did you come across that song? I just really thought, I mean, I saw beyond the overproduction of that version. I was like, this is a really cool song. It's just the three chords, you know, it's like this almost like an Indian, like, it's weird. So, what, what does it come from, Scotland or, or India? It's just a droney thing. The dun, dun, dun. And it's just, um, it was really fun that way. It was just so simple. I thought it was a, quite an uh, inspired piece of songwriting. So, I just wanted, wanted to do it and try to bring that song to people's attention even more, like, even though if they might have not heard it because they're not listening that kind of country music but but i just like that song how do you listen these days i mean do you do spotify pandora the radio usually yeah the radio the the bby here is so good it's probably like like lots of dinosaurs you know lots of mick cave and lots of stuff that don't even know about yet i mean i found out about the um the band um uh natural child from from listening to vzy it's just it's a station across the street over here from where i live and it's like a low power fm station and they play lots of good i just like turn that on usually because it's really good and um but also just you know go to youtube just remember stuff you know just try to like the internet's so funny you can pretty much find anything mm-hmm. and um i really like the meter and i listen to like a lot of old soul music still and um yeah, I've noticed this. In the, I don't have Spotify yet, but maybe one day I'll get it. Uh, yeah. Other people have it. <laughs> yeah. What about, uh, so, you know, there's been, I, I mean, according, I guess Wikipedia is not, it's not infallible, but it says there's been right. 21 former members of the Lemonheads. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. Maybe more. I mean, there have been tons. Yeah. I mean, it, I'm sure they missed a couple. If you were in a room with all of them, would you remember the era, what they played on, who, yeah, who they were? Yeah, definitely. Yeah? Definitely. I mean, usually they're used in, in, on tour, you know. Usually your records are mostly just me and, like, a couple other people. But So, yeah, there aren't many people that played on the records. But, I mean, like, I guess Bill and Bill and Carl played on one record a little while ago. You know, Bill, Bill Stevenson and Carl Alvarez. Yeah. And then um, the one before that was, like, Car button cloth, I guess so that was just Murph. That was, that was Murph and uh, Bill, Bill from the Eastern Dark, um, Bill Gibson and um, Kenny Lyon. And then before that, it was just like Nick and Dave. So there hasn't been that many people on the record, really. But, but um, on tour, there have been tons of people. Yeah, yeah. We had the drum, drummer from the Zero Boys. We had the drummer from Squirrel Bay in, in 1990. Um, we had like, um, yeah, we had Bill on tour for us. Yeah, we've we played a lot. Had a lot of people playing in the band. Uh, we talked and, a little bit about the Courtney Barnett thing, but has there been anybody else from her generation that has really spoken to you? Well, I, I met um, Kurt Weil, and he was really nice. He wanted to play um, that Victoria Williams song with me, so he played that um, um, frying pan song together, and that was really fun. He's really good. I like that Kurt Weil guy. He's That's really funny. Good. That's you know what's yeah. funny about him is like he's been mentioned by like six different people on this podcast yeah like, really okay yeah. good he wins he yeah wins. He's, he's, I, I guess i gotta I finally called, interview him for it <laughs> yes yes i was called fleetwood mac the nice and it sounds like bear trees but, it, but his name is like you know mac the nice so fleetwood mac the nice wait wait what to be convoluted fleetwood mac the nice um you know his name is who wrote mac the nice kurt vile right yeah Okay, and but he's Fleetwood Mac the knife because um he sounds like he sounds like Bear Trees era Fleetwood Mac, doesn't he? <laughs> 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 <That's> yeah. <great. laughs> yeah. You know, when when you look back on your whole canon and your contribution and yeah. it, what what yeah. is what is the song that gives you the most um the most, you know, meaning to play? I think either rudderless or like my drug buddy, something from I like a lot of the, the turn back down. I like the stuff from Shame about Ray, I think, pretty, it stands out a little bit, I think, that mm-hmm. stuff. Cool. Yeah, the brotherless, yeah. What, what, yeah. Is, what is it about those in particular? I don't know. It's just like the good chords. I don't know. Someone called it frowning music. <laughs> but, uh, um, Drow- I don't know. Drowning the, music? Frowning. Frowning, oh, frowning music. Frowning music. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't know. Um, 
No, I think it's pretty good stuff. I mean, it holds up live and stuff. It's real fun to play those songs still. So whatever, they must have been good. I like that nonchalance. Whatever, they must have been good. But here's the thing. They were good. They are good. Listen to My Drug Buddy by the Lemonheads. It's devastatingly good. And Stove. You know what? Check out our Spotify playlist, Berkeley Online. And in between the time that I'm saying this now and you listening to it, I will have put together a comprehensive introduction to the music of Evan Dando and the Lemonheads. Also, visit lemonheads.net for tour dates. And visit us at online.berkeley.edu slash take note. And join us next month when we talk to the guy who wrote Wild Thing and Angel in the Morning. But you didn't know it was the same guy. It's Chip Taylor. And he is a great conversation. Thanks very much to Evan Dando for joining us. To Joe Murray and Jenna Jones for coordinating. And thank you to Gabriel Wright for Cohen for mastering this episode. Not an easy feat when done with phone conversation, mind you. To Mark Thomas for graphic design. To Andrew Walls for audio editing. And thanks to you for listening.